Chapter 7, Branding Promotion. Now, Chapter 7 is all about creating a message that is valuable. And we talk about communications of value, we talk about it from the perspective of the audience. When we think about marketing, we think about the marketing mix, we control the variables. It's the nature of the mix is we have the control. But one of the critical aspects to the attention-based economy is you need to be of value, of relevance, of importance to your audience. So this is where we take the American Marketing Association definition, that is the creation, communication and delivery, delivery and exchange of offerings that have value. And talk about this in terms of communications that have value as well as communications of value. So the important thing here is value is determined by the recipient and marketing doesn't have marketing communications don't have to be low value. A good message, a good marketing message, a good marketing advert will be shared by a consumer to their friends if there is value in communicating that message. And it's not just the creation of a viral video, but it's the creation of an advert that does something valued. Sends a message, is of value, does something useful. The other aspect of communications of value now is social media. And this is the two phase play. You need to listen and you need to know when to speak and when to reply. So it's not just enough to be broadcasting a message. If the customer responds to you, you need to be able to talk back. And sometimes you need to be able to talk back in a way that basically tells the customer if the customer is out of line, if they are wrong, if they are harassing people, if what they're saying is harmful, you need your brand to bring the band hammer and to bring the hammer to this conversation and say no. Our brand doesn't support that. We're not going to tolerate that. So you need to have awareness. Your communications are now two-way. And this is what the platform of e-marketing communication sits inside that branching product. So from chapter six, communication works the whole of the idea, the belief, the attitude, and the values. You are, in one sense, communicating the net worth. What is the purpose of this product? But you're also teaching people how to use the product. When you show the product in use, when you show happy customers using your product, you are teaching the customer behavior that they can model. If you go back to your consumer behavior notes, you'll see that there's this whole idea of the attention to social comparison information. And this is provided by marketers when we use modeling behavior in adverts. We can, by the selection of who is in our message, tell people who the product is for and who we think the product should be used by. In this chapter, there's a lot of uh, work on communication. So I emphasize that in the book. And it's a lot easier to read than it is to talk through because it's a lot of diagrams. But critically, positioning. Positioning is one of the issues that's very central to the way that you will conduct yourself as an e-marketer. And the positioning comes through five particular elements. The behavior, the benefit, the barrier, the competition, and then the reboot. The thing about positioning is it's not about a big red reset button. When you try and reposition, you will move you will not hold that original market position, nor can you go back to it. So repositioning has got to be carefully considered. So if we start with the idea of positioning by behavior, we're using our messaging strategy to show that this is the type of behavior we want the end user to use. We are modeling ideal behavior. So if we say that we're an open company, open source, and we have no clear line of dialogue to the consumer, if all our decisions are made without any public light on them, 
we're not modeling the behavior that we're preaching. And this is one of the things about positioning is you want to be watching what your structured message, your integrated marketing communications say, against what you, the actions of your organization says. Second idea is the idea of the benefit. And this is the what's in it for you, what's in it for the user. And you basically show the user value. You model the value you want them to get. So you show them using the product, you show them getting successes, you show them, and Microsoft does a lot of this modeling. Well, I use the Microsoft Surface Pro and look, I got promoted from this success I had in this boardroom meeting. Benefit, use our software, get paid more. The barriers focusing, this is actually an interesting thing here, is that barriers focusing is a, it's a defensive, but it's also marketing maintenance. So if you are looking at a marketing growth strategy of selling more to existing customers, you need to retain those customers. And you can do so with barriers focused positioning. And this is where you go and look at getting people to see the cost of leaving why it's better to stay, why it's more beneficial to continue being part. It is a little negative focused, but basically this is still, uh, you'll see this is in terms of, when we call it barriers focused positioning, raising the barriers of departure, you should also hear the words increased loyalty, loyalty for longevity. Because if I increase the value that you get by being a long-term member of my organization, I'm increasing the barriers for you to leave because by making staying more viable and staying more beneficial. The last of the, uh, the aspects, the com competitor-based positioning, incredibly strong in e-marketing and works really well because it's very easy to align yourself and to sit yourself in proximity to a competitor so that you can get the halo effect and people can see, oh, that's the sort of product that you are. Particularly for social media, hashtags, using popular hashtags, using common hashtags, being part of events, being part of uh, you know, live real-time events, puts you alongside your rivals. But because you're all playing in the same environment, you're creating these micro communities, you're creating uh, a company of strangers model of you know, temporary convenience, we will work together all around the same hashtag, all for our individual benefit, but all in a shared way that shows everyone who's playing in this one environment, it's competition based. You don't have to name your key competitors, you have to be thought of and competition based positioning is will the audience think of me in the same light in the same space as an alternative to my primary competitor so one of the things in the whole of the communication is that it is an ongoing cyclical circular performance you position by segmentation you use your segmentation to identify your position you reinforce the positioning using the mix, the mix determines the positioning. So basically, one of the things about marketing is that it is a continual and continuous process. You are going to renew your positioning strategies by looking at the audiences you have. The audiences you have, by using that market research, will help you drive where you think you should position in their mind. Position is also relative, and this is one of the things that it is a question of, if you're positioning by benefit, you are positioning against other people's products. If you're positioning by competitor, you're going name for name, brand for brand. If you're positioning by use or behavior, sim you are relative in the positioning of the types of behaviors that the customer would otherwise be doing. There's also no such thing as an objective positioning. Positioning is always subjective because it's the interpretation by the customer. And best and better are incredibly subjective terms. 
Yes, something can be bigger, faster, stronger, but that doesn't make it better unless the customer values bigger, faster, and stronger. All right, the last aspect to this chapter is that I want to go through is the communications checklist. And this is basically a brief rundown of what each of these elements do. The chapter is massive, it is info dense, but it is designed as well to be used in conjunction with three other elements of the marketing mix and broken out across the course of the operation of the marketing plan. It serves to you in a single dose, but this thing is really a lot bigger and we've just compacted a heck of a lot into a single chapter. So the communications checklists. Basically, this is the short set of things that if you can do this around your product, you're in a good position. We start with the background materials. An absolutely mission critical element of preparing a promotional plan is to have the rest of the marketing plan. To know what your objectives are, to know what your research was, to know what your audiences were. All of the material that you collect in a marketing plan should be saved, stored, and indexed so you can come back and find it. Particularly when you want to come back and look at the background briefing. What were the audiences that were either side of the audience that you chose for this marketing plan? What were the audiences you rejected? Can you use that rejected audience in your communications message as a competitor positioning, as a negative positioning? So if you take, say, a high profile fashion brand, which really focused on a mid-teens to late-teens athletic youth market and the brand that you wanted to avoid and the market you wanted to avoid was an older middle-aged uh, sedentary lifestyle market then you would be able to use that sedentary lifestyle market as the negative of the brand so pretty much if you were trying to sell to the kids by having their parents disapprove of it you could just simply run advertising that was disapproving parental figures looking down at their noses at this horrible new youth brand that's too loud, noisy, whatever, and sell that message. And you can sell this because you went back to your background materials and said, who's the, what's my uh, research, what's my data, what, have I know, what do I already know, what have I already created? Particularly the other elements, the marketing mix, you want to look at the rest of the mix. Particularly, for those of you doing social media based products, if you're thinking about yourself as in terms of Instagram or Twitter or Facebook pages, what are the, if you're gonna position yourself, the people who you are positioning against or positioning alongside, what are they doing in their communications? If you are, say, on Instagram, you are trying to position yourself as an independent musician, and you look at the other independent musicians, and you find that they are really all going for the grainy artistic look. Do you want to position it alongside your competitors by being similar, or do you want to position in antagonism? Do you want to have the really crystal clear photos where everyone else was sort of lo-fi and high grain? You want to be able to look at what other people are doing across other elements of the mix to help determine your strategic approach to your communications. You also want to look at things like price positioning. How are you financially, time, effort and energy against the, the audience that you are trying to attract? What are the other products they're using? How are they communicating that pricing? And lastly, distribution. The channels you're going through, what types of media message show up in those channels? For example, if you're looking at going into, say, one of the off-web environments or mobile environments, you're looking at a mobile phone. And you're looking at putting an ad into a sponsored software package on a mobile phone. Grab that package. 
If you want to advertise inside the Angry Birds app, get the app and play with it for a period and look at all the ads that are in there. Dissect the ads, work out what type of message and how your communication would fit into that channel and how that distribution channel, what type of ads they use, what's the means they use. Particularly if you say you want to advertise on YouTube, you know you've got five seconds before the skip this ad button comes up. Can you actually get your message across in five seconds so that even if people did skip the ad, they've got the core of it? So know your channels, know your outlets. Also, where is the internet inside your marketing campaign? This is thinking about the internet as an adjunct to a physical world campaign, which is very important. But also think of the physical world as an adjunct to an internet campaign. Could you get traffic to an Instagram account by advertising it in a magazine? Could you get traffic to an Instagram account by it being on the side of the coffee cups at the cafe whose Instagram you're trying to promote? Of course, if you chuck a quick um, a QR code, quick response code on it, still won't help. All right, the content pitch. This is the checklist. These are quick. If you can do this for your product, you know your product well enough. So it starts with the tweet. Can you tweet it? 140 characters maximum. Realistically, 120. That way, you can someone can retweet it. About 100 is ideal. 100 characters. What's the core? What's in it for the audience from your tweet? And those 120 characters includes the link to your website or the call to action to install the software or the call to action to watch the video. The one sentence, this is the bio pitch. If you have to sum up you and your online offering in a sentence to put on your Instagram, your YouTube, your Facebook, all these places that require one sentence, can you do it? The elevator pitch, two sentences, someone says, so, what do you do? Bang, pitch it. But pitch it in terms of what I do is I work for X, we make Y, which is useful for someone like you because A, B, and C. The paragraph. This is actually one of the hardest things is to then extend the bio pitch to about 100 words. This is the detail, this is the first impression, this is, if you've got LinkedIn accounts, these bios and the bio statements are always difficult things because you've got to write accurately, positively, and whilst burning in absolute horror of, oh God, am I saying this about me? I hate these things. Everyone hates writing bio statements, get good at them. Get good at writing your own, possibly even get good at writing other people's, charge for it. The SEO plan, search engines are critical. How is someone going to find you? They're going to Google you. This is it. Nobody uses Bing. And if you do use Bing, you are Odysseus. Nobody uses Bing. It's just not a thing. No one says, I'll just Bing that for you. No. Doesn't happen. Nobody yahoos it. Nobody bings it. Nobody info seeks it. It's Google. We Google it. So Google is a verb. Take that trademark. But Google is therefore the entry point for someone to find you. So you need to be thinking, how would someone come across your products, come across you and your brand? What are they going to look for? Now, if you're in a contained environment like Instagram, what are the hashtags they're going to use? How are they going to find you? You're on Twitter. What's the search term they're going to use? But realistically, particularly if you're using Chrome, you're going to chuck that phrase into the search bar and see what comes up. So this is in the content that you use, in the way that you pitch yourself, in the language that you use, in the bio statements that you make, in the tweets that you do. Do you answer questions like, how would they solve a problem? 
Where will it be found? What is it? Are we cheap? Are we luxury? Are we expensive? Do we talk? Does our content that exists on the internet talk the language of us? Social media plan. You've been working social media. Where, when, why, and how? And this also is about, is the account there to listen or is the account there to shout? Are you basically press releases and a fax machine or are you actually listening? Will you engage? If the audience responds and leaves a comment on your Instagram, will you respond to them? How do you engage and interact with the customer and the non-customer in your social media environment and how have you got that documented in a plan? How are you going to explain that in a way that can create metrics? And those metrics can be used to justify investing time, effort, energy, and money. So it's a big chapter. This is the highlights package. A lot of the stuff that's in there is also coming from the assumption that you are either unfamiliar with advertising theory or that you need a refresher on advertising theory. If you're up to date on your IMC, Integrated Marketing Communications, you'll be fine. But this chapter has the depth and the detail to give you some of the underpinning theory and assumptions behind the decisions that you need to make to be able to fill out these checklists and these plans at the end.